Hello, I'm Simon Owens, and you're listening to The Business of Content, a podcast about how publishers create, distribute, and monetize their digital content. For this week's episode, we're going deep on the YouTube algorithm. Of all the algorithms that influence our daily internet browsing habits, few are more closely scrutinized than the one that governs YouTube. Through the homepage, the recommendations that appear on side of videos, and the trending tab, YouTube's algorithm has the ability to shower a video with millions of views and transform its unknown users into overnight stars. It's because of this very influence that so many people get angry about it. Whether it's YouTube stars who are worried about their ability to reach their fans, or liberal critics who say YouTube promotes right-wing extremism, there are plenty of politicians, journalists, and activists who are up in arms and ready to accuse YouTube executives of all sorts of nefarious evil. But how many of these accusations are merely conspiracy theories born out of paranoia? To answer that question, I interviewed Chris Stokel Walker, a journalist who covers YouTube for an online magazine called Fast Forward. Stokel Walker and I went deep on the YouTube algorithm and the ways its biggest stars game it to their benefit. Let's jump right into it. Hey, Chris, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me, Simon. So you've been writing about YouTube for a while. How did you first get interested in reporting for the company? It was basically, I guess, an excuse to uh, justify why I spend so much time watching YouTube on the site, uh, an attempt to kind of professionalize me lying in bed all day. So, no, I, I mean, I, I kind of saw the scale of the platform, the scale of the audience, and the fact that this was becoming more and more important, uh, replacing traditional celebrities in many young people's eyes, and thought that was worth covering. So I kind of spent a long time hammering on the door of editors saying, you need to pay attention to this. And it seems like with a lot of great reporters coming through um, who have also been doing the same in the US and elsewhere, we are finally kind of being heard. Yeah, it's interesting because like for the first 10 years of YouTube's existence, I encountered it the way that most older people encounter it, like, you know, older millennials and then Gen X and older, where someone would send me a link or would be embedded in uh, a blog post or something like that. I would watch that video. Um, but I wasn't like a YouTuber in the sense of like going to it homepage, following individual YouTube accounts. Uh, but I had read all these articles about how young people, that's like how, like that was their version of TV. And then like a few years ago, I, I don't know, I think it was I started dabbling in video myself and playing around with it, like, you know, shooting some of my own videos and uploading them to YouTube. And that's when it just finally clicked to me. And now like the anytime I want to waste time, I'm either going to Reddit or the YouTube homepage and the in the algorithm, which we're going to talk about today. It's just so good at just you know sending me down a hole of content and i and uh and i think it's it it, it really is kind of a a, a tv 2.0 so to speak and so uh yeah. so it, you started pitching it to like editors at like magazines and newspapers and stuff like that like stories about youtube yeah and often received no's uh i went on a big rant at the time of the very first youtube boxing match so ksi versus joe weller in london back in god that would be february 2018 or august 2018 i always get the dates wrong but anyway um i pitched it to loads of different places uh big and small and only a handful of people decided to take me up on the offer and then when uh, KSI ended up fighting Logan Paul in Manchester and then in LA, suddenly you see the ranks of press increase. So I've kind of, I felt a bit vindicated about that. I thought, oh yeah, no, maybe, maybe I was right to kind of get a bit annoyed at people. Yeah. What is the phenomenon? Can you explain it a little bit around these boxing matches? Because it seems to me that it's kind of this cynical approach to kind of create this event where these two famous YouTubers could combine their audiences and then make a lot of money in a very quick succession. Sure, but that's traditional boxing as yeah. well, right? I mean, all of these arguments, all of these beefs are, are confected entirely. But yeah, it's it's essentially a way to uh, translate online fame into offline popularity. And part of it is a you know creators, YouTubers wanting to try something new that they've not done before. You know, having twenty thousand people screaming your name is pretty cool, um, even if you have an offline audience. And then also, it's kind of justification that they are of the stature that we know them to be now, that they are traditional celebrities who can kind of hold their own and 
that that idea of clicktivism, you know, the kind of Coney 2012 engagement of clicking something but then not actually turning up to it is is actually not true anymore in 2018, 2019, 2020. And the way that they monetize it is through a finding a way to charge people to watch it uh, at from their homes, and then b also just selling tickets to to the event itself. Yeah, and covering the costs with sponsorship plus a little bit on top, broadcast rights on traditional TV increasingly, not least with the LA fight, uh, merch sales, uh, the very first YouTube boxing match, uh, they couldn't keep the merch on the stands, uh, which I thought was really interesting because it was selling so quickly. So many different ways. I mean, YouTubers are entrepreneurs, they are business people, so they know full well how to take full advantage of any money-making opportunity, and they're quite smart with it as well. And did I see that the Zone, which is kind of like a ESPN competitor in the streaming field, has started licensing some of these YouTube fights? Yeah, yeah, so DAZN got involved. So Eddie Hearn, um, who runs Matchroom Boxing, uh, said after the first Logan Paul KSI fight that he thought it was stupid, and then he ate his words a few months later and ended up promoting the second one. DAZN... um, secured a broadcasting rights deal with it they're hosting another one at the end of january which is jake paul versus um Anne ensign gibb who is a uk youtuber that's happening in miami in a specially built stadium for it so yeah these things are going to become more commonplace nowadays so you you eventually got editors to kind of come sign on to the idea that this was important stuff you also wrote a book about youtube right yeah, so YouTubers, how YouTube shook up TV and created a new generation of stars. So that came out May 2019 in the UK, I think July 2019 in the US. Um, and it's an attempt to kind of explain the platform to people who know it, people who don't. Um, it's kind of tiered in such a way that you get something out of it regardless of your knowledge level, your pre-existing base of information about YouTube. And yeah, from there doing lots of TV, radio, so I'm doing a documentary about YouTube for the BBC, for uh, Radio 4, which is kind of, I guess, our equivalent of PBS, Um, so that will, or NPR, sorry, so that will be a good thing coming out um, February 22nd, and then lots of other things planned as well. So you edit and write a publication for Medium, right? Can you tell me about that? Yeah, so that's fast forward. So that was basically partly, uh, even though there had been increased awareness of online video and editors were becoming more accommodating uh, in terms of allowing me to write about these things, there would still be occasions when I would pitch a story, editors would say no, and then an event would happen three months later that kind of demonstrated that thing I was trying to report on. So I went to ed, uh, to Medium uh, in a fit of peak and said, give me my own publication, give me a budget. I will commission freelancers who also know this world quite intimately to kind of write about things as they first happen rather than the lag between an event happening and the media covering it. So, yeah, it's been going quite well. We cover Twitch, TikTok, YouTube, going to start covering Triller because that is a thing that will become popular shortly. What is that? I don't don't even know what that is. (laughs) It's it's TikTok, but slightly different. It's the next TikTok, which in turn is the next YouTube, essentially. You know, like these things happen. Mixer, um, Facebook Gaming. I did an interview with Facebook Gaming's director uh, last night. That will be going up on the site soon, probably by the time this podcast goes out. You know, this this world is rapidly expanding. And um, if people think it's just YouTube and TikTok, then they are sorely mistaken. What's, uh, you know, Medium fascinates me as a company. What's your experience been working with them in terms of uh, you know distribution and, and being able to uh, I don't know make money as a as a writer about YouTube. Yeah, I mean it's been great. They they basically put me on a, a stipend. I'm obviously not going to say how much it mm-hmm. is, and they give me um, an editorial budget to commission freelancers and essentially complete free editorial control. So I am the editor. I am the writer. I get to commission stuff that I think is interesting. They're they're very trusting 
in that way and it's really good and do you find that like because of your because of the they have control over like they have a huge audience and then they can also promote your stuff on the home page that it gives you some advantages from a you know distribution and audience standpoint yeah i mean having the support of medium is always a very good thing so yeah it, it definitely helps in that way so i brought you on here to talk about the youtube algorithm why is the youtube algorithm so important I mean, it's so important because it is the black box that drives everything on YouTube. It's the thing that serves up the videos that we end up watching. So you talked at the very start of this program how you will watch a video and then you'll end up in some sort of rabbit hole where you're 10 videos down, you're unshaven, you kind of feel the urge to you know go to the bathroom or something like that. That is because of the algorithm. It's kind of designed to keep us entertained, designed to keep us watching, and creators who have realized this is a business from which they can make money have realized it's important for them to kind of learn how the algorithm works and to try and reverse engineer it in order to gain popularity because you have to remember the algorithm is important because of the scale of youtube so 500 hours of footage are uploaded every single minute you cannot possibly watch that in the time that you have on this planet you can't even watch a minuscule amount of that so the algorithm is kind of the sifting tool it's the thing that separates you know some videos the wheat from the chaff And let's talk about ways that we interact with this algorithm. So like a lot of people complain about the Facebook algorithm and how it's been, you know, hiding specific pages and and people can't access to their, you know, people who like their pages. But unlike Facebook, which at least shows you stuff you've subscribed to, the YouTube homepage is almost entirely algorithmically driven and shows you lots of accounts you haven't subscribed to. In fact, if you just want to view your own subscriptions, you have to click on a tiny tab on the left. Has has this generally annoyed YouTubers that they can't reach their fans as efficiently? I mean, the downplaying of subscriptions has enormously done that. So uh, you know, there was a point about a year or 18 months ago when YouTube stopped notifying subscribers of a certain channel that they had uploaded new videos, which is kind of the point of subscribing to a channel. So yeah, I mean, look, the algorithm is the thing that uh, controls the destiny of YouTubers. It's kind of the weird Norse god that you have to please at all times. So creators are fixated on it. And when they're doing well, they praise the algorithm because they think that it has looked uh, beneficially upon them. And when they're doing badly, even if it's because of the quality of their content, they somehow think they've wronged the algorithm and it is punishing them. So it's this weird thing that we don't know a lot about. And that's like an entire genre of video on YouTube, right? Where famous YouTubers, famous and unfamous, complaining, uploading a video in which they're just ranting about the YouTube algorithm. Yeah, I have this thing where I have like a a maxim where I say, if you get more than two creators in the same space at any one time, the conversation will immediately turn to the algorithm and people will give their pet theories about how it works. Because I've seen that firsthand, you know, I've been at these conferences, I've been at these meetings where suddenly they go, oh yeah, the algorithm is treating me badly today. Oh, I heard that you have to upload a video longer than this time now to please the algorithm, all of this stuff. It's kind of like black magic. And and we'll get into talks of specifics of that about in a moment. But like, so we talked about the homepage, but then there's also the sidebar on every YouTube video. It used to, correct me if I'm wrong, it used to suggest mainly just related videos that were related to whatever that video was, but now it's become more sophisticated and it's a mixture of related but also unrelated videos that it just thinks you'll like. Like, has that been, has that, have you been noticing that's been changing over the years? Yeah, well, I mean, a case in point, YouTube has made 30 changes to its algorithm in 2019. So, you know, that's more than one every two weeks. Um, So they are constantly tweaking this. And yes, part of the reason that they are doing that is because they want to keep you watching. So in the same way that Netflix will autoplay another episode of whatever it is you're watching, YouTube will do that. And occasionally it will break out of your filter bubble to say, you've watched this stuff. We think you might be interested in this. Why don't you give it a try? And so like most of the algorithms from big tech platforms, YouTube keeps it mostly a secret. Uh, But people, of course, are trying to, as you say, reverse engineer how it works. 
What are some of the biggest ways that top YouTube stars gain the algorithm? Well, I mean, there's a guy called Matt Gellin who works for Little Monster Media Company, whose job is kind of to be the YouTube algorithm whisperer. So um, I tend to follow his lead. So he says that it has to be high quality posts. So people have to like it. They have to engage with it. They have to be long videos, increasingly long videos, um, you know, 10, 20 minutes or more. And they have to be uploaded frequently, uh, which kind of brings on this idea of like industrializing the production process of YouTube, which is why YouTube's biggest creator, you know, the most subscribed channel is a Bollywood film and music TV channel. It's, you know, you can only really game the algorithm in the best way possible if you have a staff yeah and and so and talk about this trend this this kind of burnout youtube burnout trend that we're seeing now where you're seeing all these youtubers take a step back because they've they have been kind of working under the this the you know the uh, the force of the algorithm to post every single day and and they and now we're seeing them post these updates saying we're not going to post every day. Like Casey Neistat now will sometimes go weeks and weeks without um, posting a video. Like what kind of unintended consequences has this, has this algorithm created within the YouTube community? Well, I mean, it's, it's created an awful lot of stress because you know, think about it. Creators are not just on camera talent. They are often entrepreneurs. So as well as producing what is essentially a network TV show by themselves or with a very small skeleton staff every day, they're also expected to deal with the licensing, with the merchandising, with brand deals, with all of this stuff, or to hire someone in, which itself takes effort. And then you also have to have a social life. You're also dealing with social media platforms and engaging with your audience in that way, fostering a conversation. So, you know, the on-camera stuff is only a very small part of it. We haven't even gone into editing or concepting ideas or things like that. It's it's a huge amount of work that used to be done by huge production companies and teams of people, and a lot of those small creators, um, when they first start out, they're sh they're shouldering that burden themselves. And when you get to a certain size, you end up staffing out out of necessity. And so we talked about the homepage, the sidebar videos. There's this third major component, which is the trending page. How influential is that, and why do YouTubers often complain about it? It's massively influential because it essentially puts your video in front of hundreds of millions, if not billions of eyeballs. Um, and the reason that people complain about it so much is because it is dominated by traditional TV and late night TV hosts. Um, and you know, there is a reason for that. You know, It's essentially, outside of the homepage, it is YouTube's showcase to the world. And YouTube wants, having had so many problems in the last few years with sort of reputation, it wants to make sure it presents a squeaky clean face to the world so it goes for the pre-vetted sanitized stuff that has been on network tv in favor of homegrown youtube stars because they are not necessarily vetted they don't go through standards and practices or compliance they are able to do whatever they want so that is why they do it but a lot of creators think that it is kind of tamping down that creativity that idea of broadcast yourself which dominated the site in its early days yeah and so the trending i think what annoys them is trending kind of den denotes that it's some kind of algorithmically driven where it seems clear that youtube is kind of putting its hand on the scale and giving easier access to uh like like you said the late night shows in fact i think i don't know if it was you or someone else reported on this study that showed that a late night show like you know stephen colbert uh, can make it onto the trending page with only a few thousand views, whereas someone like Logan Paul can get hundreds of thousands of views and still not make it onto the trending page. Yeah, I think that was Julia Alexander probably reporting on Nerd City Data, who was a, a creator himself. But I've seen, you know, there is an academic that is currently tracking the trending page and it shows the same sort of thing. Um, it's, it's really bizarre, but I guess symptomatic of the way that YouTube has become this modern media phenomenon. It is TV and therefore it's becoming more and more like TV. Well, speaking of more, becoming more and more like TV, 
you kind of mentioned this that the the algorithm is increasingly um, rewarding longer videos. Uh, it's basically saying if you have longer watch times, then you are more likely to be shown within the algorithm. Can you talk about like a little bit of why that is? Like I'd seen some reports from like DigiDay that YouTube is really trying to go after TV advertisers, and so they're trying to reward content that looks more like tv that has like traditional episode episodic kind of structure and length is that kind of what you're you're thinking this is well it's partly the the money basis but i mean it's more fundamental than that youtube relies on serving you lots and lots of ads and the way that you get lots and lots of ads is by watching lots and lots of videos for a long time so um longer videos keep people more engaged they are more likely to watch longer you're sat on your sofa rather than watching a quick video while you're walking so um therefore it becomes better for youtube to do that so that's kind of what drives it but yeah i mean it, it is interesting how youtube set up as this thing that was the antithesis of tv and now 15 years in, it is kind of looking more and more like TV, and TV is looking more and more like YouTube. And I kind of don't like this trend, because I usually watch YouTube as a time waster, where I just have like 5 to 10 minutes time to waste. Um, I don't watch it on my couch for the most part. And what annoys me is I want to waste like five minutes and there's some video I actually really want to watch, but they've stretched it out to like 15, 20 minutes. And I feel like there's a lot more filler that you see in YouTube videos. Uh, I don't know. Do you feel, do you feel like the, the, because the algorithm is doing this, like you're like it's stretching these videos to almost an unnatural length in some instances? Oh, God, yeah. You see, like, hour-long apology videos that are really 10 minutes strung out into 60 because they know they can stack mid-roll ads in there. Um, but, you know, don't don't be sort of disheartened. That kind of content that you're looking for still does exist on YouTube. It's just that it is hidden in the undercurrent of the algorithm. So people are still posting that. Some people out there are doing this as a creative endeavor, and you can still find that. It's just harder to find. And I don't want to go too far into the adpocalypse stuff, but there's also another algorithm that's um, that's governing YouTube, and that's how ads are served. Um, has since the adpocalypse happened, which I, for, for listeners, it basically YouTube started cracking down on problematic content and trying to tried to shield its advertisers from anything that was even remotely controversial, which affected a lot of YouTubers' bottom lines. How have you how have you seen top YouTube stars try to start kind of basically cater to uh, these changes in the ad in terms of like how they approach their own content? Like, are they bleeping their words more? Like, what, what's the what's been kind of the response? I mean, a- anecdotally, they do, and um, more so with the advent of Copper, the the children online's Privacy Protection Act and the Californian equivalent of GDPR, um, which came into force uh, in January in the US, we're seeing a lot more kind of sanitized content because YouTube has created this made for kids classification where you basically won't have access to a lot of different metrics and an awful lot of adverts if you are not child friendly content or sorry, if you are the opposite, if you're kind of like declaring that you're not doing this. So that's one way in which they are changing but also it's kind of they are kind of bypassing this idea of adsense entirely you know they're going to sponsored videos they're going to brand deals they're going to merchandise because they know it's stupid to put all your eggs in one basket and to kind of rely on what is unreliable income. yeah this is something i've been meaning to write an article about it's just like really how the adpocalypse in some ways was good because it forced a lot of these YouTubers to diversify their uh, their revenue streams. Like I'm uh, like one thing I've been noticing is that more and more YouTubers, top YouTubers, are launching podcasts, for example, or launching Twitch channels. Um, is do you think this is really that like they're they're trying to kind of lessen their rely reliance on YouTube as a single platform for their income um do do you think that this threatens youtube youtube's long-term dominance that they're kind of flirting with all these other platforms yeah i mean it's absolutely a 
self-preservation technique. Um, lots of creators were really spooked in 2017 by the adpocalypse, and they kind of said, well, never again, because if this does happen once more, I could go under. So they are diversifying their income streams for good reason. In terms of whether YouTube will kind of see a significant hit on this, I mean, the scale of the platform is so great. The number of creators trying to make a living out there who would happily step into the shoes of PewDiePie or whoever is so enormous that I don't think it will have a material effect on YouTube, to be honest. They're kind of so dominant in their position that you'll see people kind of hitting away at their shins, but, you know, YouTube is... YouTube holds but they are the taking it, it seriously in terms of live streaming. I had, I've read an article in The Verge recently about how this talent agency basically started a bidding war between, you know, YouTube streaming, Twitch, uh, Mixer, Facebook gaming, where they're really kind of panicking and coughing up money to uh, to keep their biggest stars. Yeah, well, the, I mean, the battle for gaming streamers is uh, a subject that would take yet another half hour to discuss. Um, I mean, like, it, it, that is one of the big things that will happen in 2020. We are seeing guaranteed contracts being laid down for streamers, particularly game streamers, um, to kind of secure their services for a prolonged period of time. And YouTube is having to enter that because they are competing against Mixer, which is backed by Microsoft. They are competing against Twitch, which is backed by Amazon. They are competing against Facebook, which is essentially, you know, has billions of dollars to throw at anything. So you know, this is becoming a big money thing. There's a gold rush going on here at the minute. In terms of general uh, streamers, you know, people who aren't necessarily playing games, there's not so much of a market for that at the minute because there is not really an alternative. Twitch is just chatting uh, section, which is kind of its non-gaming section, is seeing huge growth. But Twitch is ultimately factors smaller than YouTube is. So currently not a lot of pressure for them outside of gaming. And I'm guessing the reason that they're so interested in this live content is because they sense that live programming, specifically sports programming, is like the last bastion that's been protected from the internet. Like you think of ESPN having this huge mode around it, has all these sports rights. It's one of the last places that advertisers can regu- like can reliably reach live audiences. And I'm guessing that these online these online streaming companies like YouTube and Twitch, they they realize that esports is like the next iteration of that and that they can get those advertisers that are looking for very in tune alert uh, live viewers yeah i mean live is vitally important but what's interesting is that you know uh, these sites aren't necessarily just looking at esports i wrote a story for fast forward maybe six months ago about how twitch had bought the rights to usa basketball um you know the the kind of national team um the men's national team and the women's national team and were broadcasting that stuff on twitch and it was doing pretty good numbers for for Twitch. So um they are definitely interested in sports rights. Uh, ESPN has, you know, a kind of moat around as you say, but Twitch and those lot are kind of interested in that as well. Amazon Prime Video here in the UK is buying uh Premier League football soccer matches. So um the idea that big broadcasters, traditional broadcasters hold the monopoly over this is certainly not guaranteed. You wrote recently about a fight going on in Germany with a bunch of YouTubers who are trying to force the company to reveal mm. its algorithm. I, I mean are they gonna get any traction there at all? They might uh in terms of they might be uh able to compel YouTube to reveal some more information. Let's be clear, we are not going to get the line-by-line description of how the YouTube algorithm works ever, because once that happens, chaos ensues. YouTube loses its competitive advantage, bad actors will game the algorithm, so that's never going to happen. But one of the issues that YouTube in particular and other video sharing platforms has is the kind of leaning on that they are facing through politicians um, and through kind of political pressure and existing data laws to be a bit more transparent and a little bit more careful about how their platforms work. So we may see that from these German YouTubers that they get something, but they're certainly, I don't think, going to get 
exactly what they want, which is here is how the YouTube algorithm works from A to Z. There's been this ongoing fight between YouTube and its cri- critics about the algor- how the algorithm is radicalizing young males by ex- exposing them to right-wing channels. Uh, I know YouTube has pushed some research suggesting that this algorithm doesn't do this. Where do you fall on this argument? Well, YouTube hasn't pushed it because YouTube directed me to this research, which is by a guy called Mark Ledwich. Um, when I approached them for comment for my BBC Radio 4 documentary, and then I followed it up with, does the fact that you are directing me to this research mean that YouTube has looked at it and agrees with it? And they were very, very categorically clear that they had not looked at it in enough detail to stand by it. Um, YouTube's algorithm and YouTube in general, the way that it works, does prioritize extreme content, whether that is extreme political content or whether that is you do stupid stunts or whether that is you have a nail creator who puts on 50 layers of nail polish because her competitors put on 45 <laughs> layers of nail polish. Like, this is not uh, big news. And we ran a story by Becca Lewis on Fast Forward, which kind of demonstrated that the ecosystem, not just the algorithm around YouTube, pushes people towards extremes. Um, and that is surprising to some people. So, you know, I certainly think that YouTube's algorithm used to push people towards extremes because it would dominate uh, watch time. It was prioritized on watch time. And if you want to get people watching longer and watching more, you push them more extreme content, whether that's political or not. However, they have made changes to the algorithm. And this is one of uh, the fundamental disagreements between those of us that have been looking at the algorithm for a long time, believe it used to Uh, push people to extremes and that it is now changing and the authors of this study who looked at things in a much shorter time scale um you know the the guy behind that uh has certain issues with journalists and how they cover youtube so uh that's you know his his study is you know valid as anybody else's in terms of the methodology that he uses the findings he kind of i think amped up a little bit and let his bias against the media creep in well it strikes me that the youtube algorithm is almost overly react like super reactive to recent events in the sense that like you know one of the rabbit holes i go down sometimes is stand up comedy clips and if i wa- watch hmm. a specific clip from like a five minute clip from some comedian I'd never seen before. Then the very next day, as soon as I log in, then all of a sudden I'm shown, you know, tons of, you know, every time that comedian appeared on the late night show with Jimmy Kimmel, like, like everything. So like what, what I did most recently, it it is very over, very reactive to, I remember, I don't, you know, I, I clicked on one Jordan Peterson video once and then all of a sudden it was for like a few days, even though I had no interest in that whatsoever, it was showing me constant Jordan Peterson clips. I, I mean, I, I could, I could really see how easy it could be to just start going down that rabbit hole, considering like how quickly it starts showing you stuff related to just one video that you happen to watch. Yeah, I mean, in, one of the big closing thoughts that I have for things like this is I speak to a lot of people inside and around YouTube, people who are there now, people who were there in the past. Um, when they built this algorithm, they didn't fully really understand how it worked and how it was quite prioritizing stuff. They have started to understand it now, but I think it's maybe too late. It kind of ran away with them a little bit. So they're trying to put the genie back in the bottle, and that is incredibly hard. One of the most concerning things that I had was a conversation with a YouTube engineer who works on the algorithm, who obviously is not able to talk to the press. So um, they will be kept... uh, anonymous and so on and they said uh that they recognized that there was an issue with the algorithm and they were working to fix it by developing another algorithm and i just thought that's kind of the tech bro mentality that got us into this problem (laughs) in the first place so i i'm i wasn't enormously keen on that but other people may have other opinions okay chris well those were all the questions i had for you where can people find more of your work online uh, I am at Stokel, S-T-O-K-E-L, on Twitter, and you can follow Fast Forward, which is ffwd.medium.com. Awesome. Well, this is a lot of fun. Thanks for joining me. Thanks so much.
Okay, thanks for joining us. I'm actually on the lookout for new guests for this podcast. So if you do interesting stuff in digital content, whether you're you're a full-time YouTuber, a media executive, or run a cool niche newsletter, definitely reach out. My email address is simonowens at gmail.com. Okay, see you next week.